Okay, so we're live. So hello everybody. Today I've got Damien McNichol with me. So we've been to America, we've been to Canada, we've been to Scotland and now we are just down the road in York, I believe. <laughs> Although you're, right, not, yeah. you're not a York person, are you? You're from Ireland originally. So um, Damien is a horse trainer and has been all over. He's been to Australia and everywhere learning his craft. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself now and tell us a bit about your backstory and your journey with horses, if that's okay. Yep. Yeah. So I'm Damien McNichol. I, um, I started riding horses when I was about eight years old, just at a riding school local to me at home. Um, it was pretty much an obsession from day one whenever I started. And so it was every weekend, every day off school. The same as I think a lot of kids is you just work for free lessons and that's, that's you worked out stables for riding time and that's pretty much all you did through your summers and everything else. Um, the day, I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore, but back in the day, that was what we probably, did. <laughs> probably not, but free labor was easy to come by then. But yeah. um, <laughs> So then, Unfortunately, the riding school I was going to actually ended up shutting down. Um, I think it was a result of actually ultimately of a claim. Someone fell off a horse. And, oh, no. you know, yeah, just the awful things that riding schools are exposed to. Yeah. Um, and actually, my dad ended up buying me this um, thoroughbred mare that um, at 15 years old was way too much horse for me. <laughs> and especially for someone who'd never really been riding a horse without somebody stood in the middle of the ring telling me what to do and you know we had this horse in my home and we've got a bit of a farm and stuff at home but it's um we have no facilities for horses you know what i mean so literally i would this big 16 hand thoroughbred mare was an ex-stable chaser <laughs> and you climb on her in the middle of this field and the way you went, you know, and like, as I say, I was used to having somebody tell me what to do all the time. So to be honest, that horse totally ruined my confidence. Um, at the same time, I was kind of getting to about 16 year old and I started drinking and going out with friends and having fun like that. So these sort of things take a back seat. So we saw the horse. Um, it was the best thing I could have done at that time. And I kind of got out of horses then for a couple of years. I went to university and I ended up um, moving to London after I finished university. I was staying with my then girlfriend in London. I was working. It was kind of just at the end. The Celtic Tiger had crashed and the recession was in Ireland. There was no jobs there. So it was kind of moving over to England to try and find any job. Um, and I was working at a factory in uh in enfield in london i'm pretty miserable about it all because you know you're in your early 20s as a young man you're trying to sort of you want some direction some sort of goal in life and um just looking through jobs i actually seen a job advertised for a groom at a place called patches equestrian center in london which was a pretty big um yeah, yeah. have you heard of it yeah 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 so it's a big competition yard it doesn't yeah, it's it's no longer in existence. It's all been oh. destroyed now for housing development. But it was a big, no. big place at the time. Yeah. And um, I went for the interview. And obviously, I, it's been a while since I had any experience with horses and things like that there. But I managed to sort of, you know, they offered me the job. So I was like, all right, happy days. So I quit me on the job. And it was actually, no, sorry, that I got it right wrong. Um, it was in the morning of the interview that I went to the job and they rang me on the way to say that, sorry, they'd already got somebody else <laughs> for the job. So I was like, anyway, I must have sounded petty enough. I managed to convince them to give me an interview. <laughs> so I, um, they gave me the job. So they took on two people and I got the job there. And that was kind of, um, that was a big step up from anything I'd ever known. I remember being so embarrassed because Everybody there was very horsey, you know, and like these people were spending over a grand a month to keep their horses at this yard on full livery. And um, I remember asking what an outline was 
because I could hear these people talk about riding in an outline and me going, what's that? You know, that's how I remember standing on a stable on the first day because I had to go and lunge this horse and they give me all its gear. And you know, like the bell bits, like overreach bits, you put yeah. it, never seen them before. I was sitting there in the stable Googling how to put these bits on because I'd never <laughs> seen them before. You know, that's how little I knew. Um, but then I was back to it. That was like reignited my sort of my, my passion for it. And um, I kind of decided that that's, that's what I was going to do with my life, I was going to be working with horses. And um, I worked there for a couple of years and then I moved to Sheffield and worked on another livery yard. Um, I actually became the manager of that yard at the time I was there. I, passed, I, passed um, I used to keep my horses in Sheffield as well. Yeah, whereabouts? In Todwick on a dressage yard. Oh, okay. See, I was out. To, I was out near Door, which is a really posh part of Sheffield. Um, <laughs> but it was um, it was a really nice yard. It was really friendly, and I got on with everybody really well. And um, yeah, it was really nice. But it was kind of it ended up getting sold on as a business to a private developer. Who, so the job finished there as well. Um, oh. So I went freelance for a little while, and then it's kind of I got in touch with a guy called Will Hunt, um, because I decided long before this that training horses was what I wanted to do, you know. Um, and I got in touch with this guy Will Hunt, who has seen some stuff about online. He's based down um, down the Cotswolds, and I went and seen him for a day, and he said, you know, you've got to go to Australia. If you want to learn this stuff, you go out and learn from the Aussies, because that's exactly what he did. So that kind of <laughs> set in mind the sort of trip to Australia. Um, so I went freelance, just freelance grooming and working with horses. And I've been learning more and more about training horses as I was kind of just working on yards and stuff. Um, just online, what I could read. Um, there's loads of stuff on YouTube if you want to learn. You know, you can actually get... You oh, can there learn is a lot. There yeah. wasn't when I was young. I had to have a book. I was in. A, I was a member of a book club, and like once a month, you'd get your books, and you'd have to read them. And I used to make notes. None of this YouTube when I was little. <laughs> yeah, I was... YouTube's amazing. You can learn to do anything on it. Um, but anyway, he put the idea of Australia in my head. Um, so that was my next big goal was to get to Australia, and eventually, the kind of time worked out that. I kind of saved enough money and was ready to go and I didn't have any major obligations. So I, um, I booked my ticket and I put up on, um, I put up on some kind of trainer forums that I follow on Facebook and stuff that I wanted to go to Australia. And if anybody sort of professionals were working out there, it would take me, that would be, um, that'd be great, you know, and that's what I was looking to do. So, very kindly, somebody put up almost straight away that they were working in a in Victoria, breaking and training in horses, and they took part in this Brumby Challenge, which is like the Mustang makeover in yeah. Australia for the Australian wild horses. And that if I wanted to come out and work for them, then they would um, they would you know feed me and house me, and I could work horses for them and do the Brumby Challenge alongside them. So. Brilliant. You don't have to ask me twice to do something like that. So that was kind of me sold on the idea. So that started my trip to Australia and my sort of, um, I spent a couple of years out there working with loads of different trainers. Um, just one led to another, led to another, led to another, you know. So And uh, I've never looked back. <laughs> so you started a horse before you went out there and did that then? I did. When I was working on... When I was working here, I'd started a few horses. One, I just like would buy little cobs and stuff like that. They're little cheap horses, and because I was working on yards and had fairly good relationships with the owners and that, they'd let me keep a horse there for very little cost, and I could play around with a few. And you know, working on livery yards, there's always people that have problems with their horses. That <laughs> I was always. Um, I was always, always able to kind of sort little issues out. Oh, I think I had a natural kind of affiliation for understanding how they work to some extent, you know, and I could get quite good results. I wouldn't say I'm the most talented rider in the world, 
um, because but I'm pretty um, I'm pretty aware when I'm riding of what I'm asking for and what I'm trying to get and I think that gets me a lot further than um, sort of being years and years of lessons to be sitting pretty if you know what I mean so there's a bit of a difference then between a little cob and uh, a wild brumby. So tell us how that all panned out then. Um, so the brumby, the brumbies were basically um, they were passively trapped, um, which means they were kind of. I think over a certain period of time they were fed you know, the bunches of hay and stuff that they'd come to and they know where to come over time and eventually they kind of came into pens mm -hmm. and were just closed off. And they do and that so, for welfare issues, don't they, if anybody doesn't understand that's listening? Because obviously I'm obsessed with watching, like, the Mustang makeovers on YouTube and stuff. Mm -hmm. But is it the same with the Brumby Challenge, that they rounded up for welfare reasons? Well, essentially the Brumbies are an invasive species in Australia. Mm -hmm. So... They're feral horses as opposed to wild horses. So horses didn't come to Australia until Australia was colonised. Um, and since then, that's when the Brumbies started. So they would have been horses that either escaped or were let go. And over mm -hmm. time, have just bred. And um, yeah, they've they've really done well in Australia. You know, for you know, it's it's very much it's horses. Um, but essentially they're an invasive species and they shouldn't be there and they're certainly causing some damage to the environment. Um, and they become a big political hearts and minds sort of issue. Mm. Um, but the sort of more hardcore elements would be like some of the Collins really cruel, like shooting them out of helicopters and stuff like that there. It's some really sort of devastating stuff happening to them. And the whole idea of the Bromby Challenge is to show that actually these horses have some value to us and that if we can be captured and trained they're really nice little riding horses you know yeah. so these horses for the challenge are passively trapped so they just to avoid as much sort of trauma as possible mm -hmm. um and then they're taken and they're given whatever shots they need to be given and uh if they're male they're gelded and sort of then they're given you know, six months to a year out in massive big paddocks to kind of recuperate from their from being gelded. And then a certain amount are selected to take part in this competition. Um, and so then they're allocated to certain trainers. And so when you come and pick them up, they're all in just these little pens. They draft it out. The trailer's kind of set up in a run and they just sort of get hunted on, you know, and like... Yeah. I, they are wild. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. They've never been touched. Um, and um, I think the really nice thing about them is they're proper blank canvas. You really yeah. do, they don't have any baggage. And I, have, you know, at this point, I had a fair idea of what I was doing. I knew how I was going to approach it. I knew all the theory. It was about kind of putting it into practice. Um, from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, and, and some subscriptions and stuff that I learned a little bit more. And by that time, I'd already been in Australia sort of six months longer than that. And right. um, But, I mean, I've, I've shortened that bit where I was working in yards and stuff. You know, I've been working with horses full time for about seven years at that point. Yeah. So it wasn't like um, I was a total stranger to them. But, um, yeah, so... Because I had 150 days, so to put that into context, it's almost six months. You know, you, so at the very beginning, it feels like you've actually got quite a lot of time to get something done, so you're not in a rush. And I think not being in a rush really kind of really helps you in that element. Um, so I just spent the time gaining the horse's trust. I knew that I had to get certain things done. I knew I had to get him to face me. I knew I had to get him to stay facing me as I walked around. I knew I had to let him get closer to me bit by bit. I could use a stick to get touching him. You know, it was just everything was very step by step and very gradual. And um, he responded really well. He was a really, really genuine little horse. Um, and because I felt I had the time that I needed, 
I um, I didn't feel rushed, and I think not feeling rushed is really important with horses. Um, and so it was really, really well step by step. He never bucked, I never fell off him, I never had any big setbacks. I just literally took it step by step, day by day, and we got we ended up doing really well. He'd been watching um, it as well then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, a quick question from the bath. My husband's in the bath again asking questions. He said, What does it feel like meeting a wild horse on day one? Is it scary? Sorry, repeat that. The sign just broke up a little bit. What does it feel like meeting a wild horse on day one? Is it scary? It's more scary for the horse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, luckily, the people I was staying with had a bit of a setup. So, you could you could work wild horses um so they had like big high posted real yards because it wouldn't take a lot of pressure for these horses to just jump out of somewhere um so they had big like six foot real yards that weren't too big that the horse could run away but big enough that you could keep your distance from them so i never felt particularly scared um certainly not in the beginning because it didn't take very much to get a reaction from them so you just had to be very very small in what you did to get a reaction out of them you know um so no i didn't find it particularly scary the first ride i find a little bit scary but <laughs> he actually did very well in it, so it was all right <laughs> oh, brilliant and what about the competition then you're a reserve champion tell us a bit more about that so the competition was over four days at equitana equitana is like um I suppose Australia's version of Olympia. Right. I've been to uh, Germany. Is it the same thing? I think they actually do do it in Germany. Yeah. Um, normally, Equitan is just a um, southern hemisphere thing. So each year it goes between Australia and then New Zealand. Oh, right. Okay. So it's, a, it's the biggest horse expo in the southern hemisphere. So it's the biggest one they do down there. Um, and it's got everything at it. Um, but it's over four days. The first day is like a handling and conditioning class. So you have to lead the horse around, take him into like a little round yard. You take the halter off him, come out of the round yard, stand with your back to them, go back in, catch them again, pick up their feet, rub them all over and put them on a trailer and take them off and lead them out. That's day one. Um, Second day is a written pattern, so it's a little bit like a dressage test. It's um, walk, trot, canter, circles. Um, third day is an obstacle course, so a bit like um, you've all sorts of fallen logs and little bridges and like streamers and stuff to ride through and gates to open, that kind of thing. And the last day is like a freestyle, so you have to come up with your own kind of program to. To music for about I think it was about four minutes or something you were allowed. Brilliant. So that's quite an achievement then being reserve champion at something like uh, that. You know what? I went into it as one of the one of the very few people registered as an amateur. Um, <laughs> most people were like down as professionals in it, so I was not expecting anywhere near that result. I was just sort of the reason I wanted to do it is I wanted to go and try and train a wild, train a wild horse, you know. That was so Amazing. to come in that position was really, really pretty humbling. And um, yeah, it was over the moon with it. It didn't feel very deserved, if you know what I mean. It's kind of, <laughs> I don't know. I um, and did they get it was over the moon. He couldn't have done any better for me. He really, really tried his heart out. It was and did they get really auctioned off then, like the Mustangs do? Yeah, they do. So then the auctions at the end of the competition. So. Um, is that heartbreaking when you've got to say goodbye after going through all that together? Oh my god! Like it's, <laughs> you know, you actually you do get to take them back with you again, and then the new owner comes and they have a few lessons with you before they take them away and stuff. So you sort of have a bit of a handover. But yeah, it was it was truly heartbreaking. I'm not afraid to say that I did. I cried when that horse went like. And, oh, um, <laughs> brilliant! You know what? Yeah, it was six months of everything you could give it and mm -hmm. i don't think i ever put so much effort into anything in my life in mm -hmm. terms of every day twice a day at least it was kind of working with this horse and yeah the hours and time they went into it was just like nothing else and so 
yeah, it was just a proper, a proper end of an era in a way. Those six months, you know. But the mm-hmm. owner, the person who um, he sold to, Moonshine was his name. Um, I actually I knew her already because she would kind of come round. So she knew the horse already, and she kind of knew me and our journey and everything we got there because she was she was friends with the person I was staying with, Georgia, Georgia, all of us, and. Um, so I was really happy for the horse to go to him or go to her, and now her um, her kids are riding that horse. I get pictures of her sons, like Harry, eight years old, riding down the road on him. So it's like he's a proper kids' pony now, which is really nice. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> cool. So tell us about when you worked on the. You said that you worked um, on a thoroughbred stud handling falls and doing yearling prep, but with a difference. So what was the difference? <laughs> So when I went out to Australia at the very beginning, it was actually Warwick Schiller who put me in touch with a guy called Luke Thomas, who goes out to um, thoroughbred studs every year and does all the initial handling of the foals. Um, so these thoroughbred studs might have two, three hundred foals a year, and he gets the job of doing all that first initial catching, handling, getting them to lead, everything like that. There we all these foals. Is that the guy that Warwick did a video with or a couple of yeah, videos? The very, yeah, the oh, same bloke, yeah. It was amazing. It was yeah, so, amazing. So that's a guy I went out and spent real, a bit of time with doing that. Perfect, wasn't he? And he does, it, it was fascinating. Yeah, so um, that was one of the first people I met when I went out to Australia, so I remember I got to Melbourne and spent a couple of days in Melbourne and then got a train up to Young in New South Wales. And I remember landing at Young and getting out. And this was January, so it was the middle of summer. Um, getting out at the train station and it was like 40 degrees. Oh. And I was <laughs> like, I was still sort of still sort of getting used to my new surroundings and everything i was just sort of begging in the heat waiting for somebody i didn't know to come and pick me up yeah it's like I'm look, Ireland, i might melt <laughs> yeah, literally like i'm still a little bit afraid of like the skin cancer that i've got from being out there but um, <laughs> so luke turns up in his little yellow ute called ian <laughs> with two dogs in the back and a couple of saddles and you know he's got this big wide brim sort of straw hat on so yeah, Luke Thomas is definitely a bit of a character, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, really, really, a friend of Luke's who I spent some other time with once told me like the thing about Luke is he is real. He like he's been out to the stations breaking some really tough horses for years and years and years. He really, and when you watch him work, you don't really know what's going on until all of a sudden it's all clicking and everything's working. You know what I mean? Luke spent um, proper time with Ray Hunt when Ray Hunt came to Australia. Luke was his sort of his um, little man. So he's a really um, he gets some really interesting things done with horses, and he's kind of at that um, that level where it's all kind of about energy and um, stuff that's a bit further than I am. Stuff is a bit further beyond where I am, you know. But um, so, how long did you spend with him? I spent so initially it was about a month, and then I actually handling. So that was handling the foals, and then I went to work with the yearlings up in the barn, which is just by myself working for the red stud. Right. Um, but on and off, I spent quite a bit of time with Luke. And sort of, we came back and forth with him a few times and worked with some of his own horses and stuff. Um, but the falls are really interesting. Um, I'll never forget what he told me. It was like the falls are ten times more reactive and ten times less responsive. So it's like everything you add, like they're just so explosive in what you're asking them to do at the beginning. So you just you got to be so subtle with them and so careful, and your time is just going to be right and. Like in terms of your handling skills with a horse, they just go up so rapidly when you're working with foals because you've got to be so on the ball with them because, oh, like, 
they're just little firecrackers, you know. Like I remember we were teaching one to load onto a trailer, and I wasn't paying enough attention, and I was stood kind of at the side of the ramp, and this thing jumped off the ramp and literally jumped straight through my face. You know, it was like <laughs> just like proper knock me for sex. But it's like where a normal horse would not have done that. You know what yeah. I mean? It's that kind of that's just blind reactiveness that you get in a foal that you don't get um, in other horses that. Yeah, I really learned a lot from the bulls. It was really cool. Excellent. With the with the yearlings in the barn, that was more. Um, you're you're prepping them for for the sales. So basically, they're in the barn. They're getting fed the absolute gills, and you're prepping them for the sales. So every day you got to go out and teach them how to parade. You know, so that when they go to the sales, they can parade and look good and be sold and everything like that. There, but. For the most part, the staff were just going out with these horses and just surviving for the 10 minutes that we were out there because these horses were so full of feed and so fresh and so kind of uneducated at that point, you know, and just like, it's just disaster after disaster waiting to happen. So I actually got them, I was started working, so I took them to the little yard that they got and got them, you know, started doing some groundwork, getting them stepping over, moving their kind quarters, moving their four quarters, yeah. stopping when you stop, backing up, all that kind of stuff. So as far as uh, that was really good as well, because again, if you're working with 20 or 30 horses a day, doing that repetition every single time. So in terms of, again, getting your experience on up and handling lots of different horses all the time, it was really, really good. Yeah. Cool. So what about being a ringer on a cattle station then? That sounds cool as well. <laughs> yeah, that was class. Um, what does that even mean? I don't even know what that means. So a ringer is like, um, like a stockman, like a cowboy, like a typically someone who musters, musters cattle. Okay. So, so um, the cattle station I was on was actually in the Australia scheme of things, it was very small. It was a thirty thousand acre um, farm, <laughs> yeah. which is which is properly is small fry in Australia. But I was the it was me and my um, my fiance Shannon, um, who went out and we were the sole employees of this place. You know, so it was the uh, the guy who owned it. And us, who would kind of run the whole thing, and he had two thousand heads of cattle there. My way. And so we had to learn a how to muster cattle. And normally he'd done everything on quad bike because he was used to sort of being a pretty small team. Yeah. And quad bikes are a lot; they don't get tired, you know. What I mean? So it's a lot sort of easier for him to nip around. But he got all these really nice horses, and then you know that he'd spent thirty odd grand on the year <laughs> before in an auction and um had just burst them hadn't done anything with them you know so it was kind of like he was interested in me coming to work there because i could get the horses going again and um, yeah. so there was when i got my first taste of a horse really wanting to do its job and like these horses were bred for this um and that they naturally they're like a like a sheep dog they almost naturally pick up a cow and want to do yeah. it you know and it's it's a totally different feeling of riding i remember i was on this one horse called hollywood and she was like a big the thing about the australian stock horse is they're not they're quite highly bred they're a lot more thoroughbred almost than anything else um especially because they breed them for camp drafting and stuff they breed them pretty hot they're pretty sort of fiery sort of horses um and we were like she was pretty young and she didn't know too much so she'd get really wound up about things but we were working with cows and calves and we were kind of pushing them out we had them in the yards and then we were pushing them back out to the field so outside the yard you've got what's called a cooling paddock which is like somewhere you put them into to stop them running out they get to calm down there for a little bit and then you open a gate and push them out there and that's what we were doing but calves are a bit like foals where if they get separated off from the mother they won't um they won't think to turn back and go back to the gate you know they'll just run along the fence and sort of get lost along there mm -hmm. and i sent this horse hollywood out after this calf 
you know, the calf was sort of run down along the fence and I was sort of picking up speed running down after it. And then the second we got within that calf's eye line where I was thinking, okay, now we're going to pull up in front of this calf to pull him back. The horse had already slammed on the brakes. The guy was nearly out the front door. It had sort of stopped that heart and whipped around and cut the calf off. Like, I had not asked the horse to do this. It just knew to do it, you know, and that's different feeling when you've got a cow in front of you and it's sort of pulling and cutting it off and it's it's unreal. It's and a totally you different feeling. Have you done anything like that before? No. No. <laughs> so this guy who was used to riding quad bikes was kind of trying to trying to train you guys or were you trying to figure it out by yourselves well i suppose it doesn't really matter if you're um mustering cattle on a horse or whether you're doing it on quad bike well, the, the, the idea is the same you've just got a different mode of transport you know so yeah. he was interested in me because i could get the horses going um because <laughs> he had all these nice horses sitting doing nothing you know oh, but wow. um yeah, it was such a cool experience, and there's nothing. Sounds, does sound like an amazing experience. <laughs> yeah, it was class. What do you think the most important thing is that you've learned then through all your travels and through your journey with horses so far? Stay humble. Why is that? Um, for me, any time I, um, any time I think I've got this. <laughs> A horse very quickly tells me that I don't. Yeah. Um, almost instantly. So for me, it's kind of taught me that um, don't assume any knowledge. You know what I mean? You got to take each horse as it comes, and How just because. Say- Go on. Just because something worked with one horse, it doesn't mean it will work with the next. How do you stay positive in the face of that? You know, you think, oh, I'm just starting to get this now. And then like, oh, wham, no, I'm not. You know, what? Yesterday was a high. Today feels like a complete low. Where, how, how do you pick yourself up with that? I think because um, horses have, up until very recently, been a full-time job for me. I had no choice but to go out the next day and do it again. Mm. Um, so anytime I've had a low with a horse it doesn't matter the next day you have to go and you have to face that horse again and you have to do whatever you were doing so that the obligation is probably not being as much to do with it as anything else I know whenever I worked the last place I worked in Australia was for a guy called Ray Matthews and that was almost exclusively breaking in thoroughbreds um, which was not sort of it was pretty, pretty wild. You know, it was um, pretty hard and fast and not the kind of horsemanship I went out to learn more about, if you know what I mean, by and large. But I probably learned more there than anywhere else because you're literally riding 12 horses a day and none of them were easy rides, you know what I mean? Yeah. So something would go wrong and you had no choice. You had to go out and you had to get on that horse the next day and you had to yeah. find a way through it. So I think for me, it's, it's largely been obligation. I think if it was all my old horse, my own horses in the field, it would be harder. Mm. That's the honest answer to it. Cool. And what? So, a similar question then. What frustrates you when training, and how do you deal with that? Time frames. Um, I think the thing that frustrates me most is time. Again, I can use the example of when I was working for Ray Matthews. If you're riding 12 horses a day, like as much as you love riding horses, that becomes very much a job. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, okay, I've got all these horses to work. And so you're riding one horse thinking about the next horse. Yeah. And that's that's frustrating because then you don't have time for that horse that you're riding. And I think I don't like myself. And how I am with the horses whenever I'm in that frame of mind, mm. because that's your job five, six days a week, you know. Um, yeah. And as much as I learned there, and as much as like raise a proper mentor to me, um, 
I was glad to sort of get finished there because I wasn't liking how I was starting to feel about the horses. Mm. Um, and I think that purely was a time aspect. It was so now, like I'm working with, I'm working with two different horses at the minute. Um, and I find that really nice because both of the owners have, you know, I charge the same no matter how much time I spend with the horse. So they're not feeling like they're getting ripped off if I'm spending two hours playing about with something. Yeah. But I don't feel obligated to rush. And I find yeah. if I if I know I've got all day to do something, then I don't get frustrated with the horse. Yeah. So yeah. that is, that's honestly what I find my hardest thing. If I've got other obligations, I think you've got to have all the time you need with a horse to really get something going. Yeah. Brilliant. So, right, here's an interesting question. What is your relationship with fear? Mm. Given some of the experiences we've, we've just discussed. <laughs> I think um, it's a really good question when that comes to working with horses because I think there's so much people with horses pretend that they're very very tough mm -hmm. um, you'll see all the memes on Facebook like uh, like I can control a 1000 pound animal with nothing but my arse cheeks and all this sort of stuff mm -hmm. and talking about the amount of horse people you'll meet to talk about it's almost like bragging about the falls they've had and the injuries they've had and all this here sort of stuff and i think we talk about that as horse people because no one wants to admit that they are afraid and i think what led me down this sort of track of finding a better way to be with horses is because of fear and it mm. is because I don't like getting hurt. And mm. so if it's me working with a horse on my own terms, then I'll sort of, I'm, I'm probably overcautious in a lot of ways and I'll take more time than possibly I needed to take. But if I'm working on somebody else's time, I'll get on and I'll go. Mm. Um, I tend to find that the fear sort of goes away whenever I swing my leg over. Because then it's too late to worry. You just got to do what you got to do. Um, <laughs> and it's the same. I used to I used to do skydiving when I was at university. Again, it was a kind of the the fear goes as soon as you jump out. The if the, if you're doing public speaking or you're doing anything and that you're sort of really nervous about beforehand. Yeah. The fear dissipates as soon as you start doing it. Yeah. And so for me, I know that about fear. So I know that I don't really have to worry about it. And what kind of happens, happens. But when it comes to breaking in horses, I want to have a fair idea that that horse isn't going to isn't going to do anything too mad before I get on it. Yeah. <laughs> but. Is it one of um, Warwick's sayings that I'm, I'm not brave, I'm thorough? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a beacon of hope for me. I think maybe there is a future to me one day getting back into the saddle if I can think that I've ticked all the boxes. Whereas in a former life, you know, you get on it and you just, be expected to just deal with whatever happens and maybe you'd lunge it around a couple of times and let it have a book and, and what have you and then get on and you know hopefully now um, I think oh my beacon of hope is that if if I have sort of done all the preparation and been thorough enough I'll dare get back on one day but the other thing is if you're if you're if you're riding and you're not enjoying it because you're afraid then don't ride you know what I mean yeah. you don't need to be afraid you don't need to if that's that's not something you enjoy, then why do it? And I think so many people have this relationship with their horses where they're actually just scared all the time. Yeah. yeah. And you don't need to be like that. No. You don't have to you don't have to ride your horse if you don't want to, you know, but it's it's that's peer perfect. pressure from everybody else around, I think, that yeah. causes it. And that's what we were discussing sort of before we went live, that that's the pleasure that I'm getting now with my daughter's ponies, just, you know, doing the liberty competitions and the horse agility competitions, having something to work yeah. towards, because I love training um, and having goals. 
Um, but yeah, I, I don't feel the need to be riding at the minute, but I can still have a relationship with the horses. So, um, and that's a key message that I want to get out there to people as well, really. Uh, you can still enjoy being around horses without riding. Um, yeah. So was it, was it a, did you have a fall or was it no. a sort of gradual thing that kind of? Gradual sort of. Yeah. Being overhorsed and being in situations like yourself on, on yards where you've just got to get on with it and um yeah and the more you feel out of control the more you program your brain don't you you program those pathways in your brain to think i'm out of control i'm frightened and yeah. then that comes the story that you tell yourself and and when you said it told it for 30 years it's like whoa now i need to now i need to tell a different story <laughs> so cool so what's the one thing you wish you'd known when you began your career your horse career Um, I wish I didn't, um, I wish I started five years earlier and I wish I started my kind of, um, I wish I'd known how open people are to having you learn from them and not necessarily in England or Ireland, you know what I mean? There's a world full of people who know a lot about horses and if you're if you're willing to go to them and put in the effort then you can learn a hell of a lot um yeah i suppose i spent so much time in the beginning with sort of the suppose the, the classical kind of british horse people who would um horse training was like some sort of big secret mm -hmm. and it's like everybody knew something you didn't know and nobody wanted to tell you what they were doing and the, i wish it took me less than five years to figure out that there was more out there and that there was more there's plenty of people willing to teach you if you're willing to sort of show the effort and enthusiasm you know that's probably what I'd want to want to tell myself at twenty. You know, <laughs> wish we all had that time machine. Eh? Mm. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, right. What was your biggest failure, and what did you learn from it? So you know what? When you sent me these questions, I was thinking a lot about what that would be, and it's got nothing to do with horses, but it's <laughs> um, so. In Northern Ireland, we did a thing called the Eleven Plus. So, don't did you have that in England? Was that a thing in England? Yeah. yeah. So it was, a, it was something you did when you were about ten or eleven years old, and it was at the end of primary school, late school, you were to and ten, ten to four. And um, my brothers and sisters all got A's in their Eleven Plus, and I don't know, I suppose it's kind of naivety. I just assumed that I would get my <laughs> because all my brothers and sisters went and got that. So um, I didn't get an A, I got a B1, which was just the one step down from an A, which isn't exactly a fail by any matter of means, but it felt like such a failure to me. It was the first kind of proper, I don't know, it was almost like suddenly I wasn't as good as them, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. Um, and it was a proper knock to my confidence. And I think it really took the try out of me in school mm -hmm. after that. I, you know what, I, I did enough. I got by, but I was never interested in really trying because I feel like I did try for my 11 plus and I didn't get very far. So it was like, um, not that I didn't get very far, I still passed, but it felt like a proper failure. Yeah. And um, that's probably the thing that's sat with me for the longest. And it's probably only in the last five years that I've kind of gotten past that in terms of um, knowing that I don't need to be particularly academic to get where I want to be in life. And that.
yeah, I'm doing all right without it. And that I wish I never actually put so much basis on <laughs> academia and going to university and stuff. I wish I never bothered. I really do. Yeah. Um, so do that think, was my big. Sorry, go ahead. Do you think you would handle that differently now? Like if you were, if you could turn the clock back with what you know now? Yeah, 100%. Um, I probably wouldn't have done the 11 plus. <laughs> <laughs> You've been out riding instead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay. So what what are the best resources that have helped you along the way? Books or um, DVDs, online material, other than YouTube? Yeah, I mean, YouTube was great, but YouTube led, led to a load of other things. So it led to like a Warwickshire subscription, which is fantastic. Um, I also subscribed to like the TRT method of Tristan Tucker. Um, also, when I was in Australia, I bought, I used to go around all these secondhand um, bookstores, and there's so many horse books in there. So I'd buy all these old sort of horse training books oh, wow. um, from all these like just old school Aussie guys. <laughs> and although there's so many of the horsemanship methods that I wouldn't agree on, there is all these little little, little nuggets. Yeah. yeah. So I really don't discount anybody. I think you can learn something from everybody. Um, so there was a, oh, I can't even remember the name of it now. I'll not even talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a couple of, yeah, there's a couple of really sort of old school training books that I got and I've probably learned more out of those books, even if it's in terms of what not to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, books and if you can find online subscriptions to the likes of the next one I want to get is Jonathan Field. They're oh, really yeah. they are pretty expensive, but they're worth yeah. we're really worth signing up to. There's so much you can get off the internet. Uh, yeah, I, I I like watching videos because you can keep watching them again and again. If you go to a clinic, you've probably forgotten eighty percent of it afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. But watching videos over and over again and then a video myself and watch that over and over again and um, yeah it is great i'm reading jonathan field's book at the minute and i'm loving it it's great yeah so who's been the most influential person in your career then probably a guy i met in australia called lucky cosser um, sounds like a character already <laughs> yeah. <name> like <laughs> he was um he's a friend of luke thomas's who look um, put me in touch with after I'd finished um, sort of working with him. And again, this was another person I was sat waiting at a train station in the middle of nowhere, waiting to be picked up by somebody I didn't know. You know, <laughs> um, and he turns up with a big black cowboy hat on, and Lockie's a proper character. Like, um, he's a proper showman. He just he does this um, outback stockman show. So he travels around with all these animals and all these horses and a big massive bullock that he rides around and does like an entertainment show with all these ag shows and stuff. Um, but again, he was kind of, he's again the real deal. He's worked in all these big cattle stations. His dad was his horse breaker. His dad before that was a horse breaker. They were really sort of, you know, it was his job at 10 years old to be doing the job that I was doing at Ray Matthews, breaking in all these horses, you know, he was sort of. And um, all through the Bromby Challenge, anytime I was having sort of problems or needed a bit of sort of motivation, I would ring him and he would be able to sort of point me in the right direction and keep me going. And it was that nice kind of balance of, knowing the sort of natural horsemanship side and then knowing the reality side and sort of keeping that in check for me and knowing all right you, you actually have to be getting on with this a bit now you know like it's um yeah so he's the things he could get his horses to do time and time and time and time again without fail like this one horse ernie that would lie down three times a show every show and he might do three shows a day. So we'd have that horse lie down nine times a day in front of anything going on. And it would do it without fail, you know, and his, yeah. um, his horsemanship was just inspiring, really was. Brilliant. And do you stay in touch now? 
Yeah, I do. Um, I haven't spoken to him in a little while now, but um, yeah, we keep in touch. Um, it's someone you could always sort of feel you could call. Brilliant. So down to my last two questions then. The question that I ask everybody is, how do you believe in yourself? When we have life's little setbacks, how do you keep believing in yourself? Um, I am a doubter. I definitely do doubt myself. Um, I think in all honesty, my, I kind of have a bit of a vision that I've got set out for myself about what I'd like to do. And um, I've just, I think I've just, I've just got the motivation to keep working towards that sort of regardless. So I'm also very lucky that my girlfriend, Shannon's um, very, very supportive of what I'm doing. And anytime I'm sort of feeling a bit down, down about myself or down about what's happened, she'll sort of pick me up. And oh. um, yeah, so I'd say it's as much to do with Shannon keeping me going as it is to. Um, I just, uh, I kind of haven't given myself another option. You know, I've kind of, that's what I'm working towards and that's what I'm going to keep doing. So as long as nothing too catastrophic happens. What is the goal then? What's the goal for 2021 and what's the big the big vision? So really I've kind of, I've learned enough in the last couple of years that I've learned enough of other people's methods that I need to go and find out my own method now or kind of, so ideally what I want to do is go away and work with a few hundred horses and sort of see where I'm at. Um, to the or the biggest thing is facilities. Facilities are really hard, really expensive, really hard to come by. And, you know, if you're to set up a business, training horses, you know, it's a lot of outlay in the beginning to try and secure the premises. And it's a big risk and everything else. So I've actually, I've managed to make a bit of a contact back at home. Um, mm -hmm. He's got a yard and would be happy for me to use it um, for sort of, a very reasonable price so my plan is to sort of go back to ireland maybe this year maybe next year depending it's really unsure this year um mm -hmm. and i'll probably get into buying and selling horses for a little while right. sort of trying to buy them young and break them in and sell them and that way it would give me the time that i want to work with them and do what mm -hmm. i want to do um and i could still get the you know still get the experience across a broad range of horses by doing yeah. that and then i think ultimately i'd like my hand in a lot of things i'd like to sort of have my own horses i'd be bringing up through i'd like to be teaching people i'd like to have people bring me horses for training so if i could do i foresee in my horse business not to be any one thing i'd like it to be lots of little different things mm -hmm. um i suppose for sorry go ahead. Any more competition goals? No, I'm really, I've never been a competition person. I've never been particularly competitive. I'm not really that interested in it. Um, right. I just like training horses. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Brilliant. So if people want to find out more about you, then where can they find out about you? Um, probably best to look me up on Facebook. It's uh, D McNichol Horse Starting and Training. I've got an Instagram as well. I need to get more sort of active on social media again. I've gotten a bit lazy about it. Um, but that's that's where to find me. Brilliant. Super. Well, thank you so much for um, joining us. And yeah, it's thank been, you. It's been fascinating. little tour all around Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, hopefully we'll speak again. And um, you take care. Yeah, you too. See you later. Nice job. Cheerio. Bye.